Hi everyone, this is Jikai Dane of the N Mitsuji Tendai Temple, helping you to become the potent advocate for Dharma that the Buddha calls us to be. Most people interested in Japanese Buddhism will no doubt stumble upon the name of the Tendai school at some point during their journey. If they're not seeking Tendai out directly, they'll most likely find that the founder of their own tradition was initially trained as a Tendai monk, or alternatively, that the Tendai school constituted the main rival of their own sect. Indeed, given that the Tendai school's contemporary reach is rather modest, it will invariably be the case that most people make first contact with the Tendai sect indirectly as part of some other sectarian history. Now we can imagine how this might paint a rather biased or distorted picture of the Tendai tradition itself, as these accounts naturally exhibit a bias in favour of those alternative movements. Such accounts often speak of the Tendai tradition in rather disparaging terms, and this shouldn't be altogether surprising, because in almost all of those cases, those traditions needed to establish themselves as distinct from the Tendai school, or alternatively, they intended to critique the Tendai position. Needless to say, this is not a particularly useful way of studying Tendai Buddhism itself, although it can be a rather illuminating way of understanding the tradition that is presenting that particular information. It's with a mind to remedying this imbalance that with this video, I intend to begin a series of short videos which outline the depth and breadth of the Tendai tradition more broadly. I must advise viewers here and now that the Tendai school is notoriously deep and notoriously broad. And therefore, given the nature of these shorter videos, I will, as a matter of course, only be able to scratch the surface of this magnificent iceberg. Atop these broad overviews, I do intend to investigate concepts in more detail later on, but on this occasion, I ask you to indulge me in good faith. And so given that most people encounter the Tendai tradition in passing while researching other schools, I thought it might be best to start at the very beginning and discuss what the name Tiantai or Tendai actually means, as well as how the symbolism in the name helps us to interpret the meaning implicit within the Japanese Tendai school's crest or emblem. It's good to start with an appreciation for what our school is called in different languages and why. The name Tendaishu, meaning Tendai school or Tendai sect, is the Japanese reading of the Chinese name Tian Taizong. This same name is also pronounced as Chon Taizong in Korean. Now, the reason that we have this name in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean variations is because it refers to a particular Buddhist lineage that arose first in China and then spread to Japan and Korea. Over time, these lineages naturally developed their own unique features and differences, but we are and always will be the same lineage. We are one singular family, or Ekakula in Sanskrit. This means that Tiantai is Tendai, is Chonte. Brothers and sisters may differ, but they are still one family. We have absorbed different experiences, practices, and ideas, but we are one school. So you may therefore hear myself or others use the term Tiantai to refer to the Chinese side of our family, or Tendai to refer to the Japanese half. But in each case, this is merely paying respect to each member of our collective family. In short, it must be stressed at the very outset that despite our differences, we consider ourselves to be members of a single lineage, and understanding this is crucial to appreciating the broader traditions of our family. Now that we have the cultural variations of the name in hand, we can turn our attention to discussing two possible variations of the name that you might come in contact with when you explore the literature of our tradition.
So the first one is Tendai Hokke Shu, and this is the official name of our school in Japan, as it was the term chosen by Dengyo Daishi Saicho when he transmitted the Chinese Tiantai lineage to his country. You'll notice that this name has an extra component to the usual Tendai Shu that we spoke about just a moment ago, and this is of course the word Hokke. Now Hokke is made up of two characters, meaning Dharma flower, and this is of course a reference to the sublime Dharma of the Lotus Flower Sutra, or Lotus Sutra for short. This is because the Lotus Sutra is our tradition's final authority or Pratisharana. So because the Lotus Sutra is our final authority or Pratisharana, we sometimes simply shorten the name of our school to Hokkeshu, or Dharma Flower School or Sect. So when you see Nichiren Buddhists, who later chose to also refer to their own schools as Hokkeshu, the implication was intended to be that they were continuing the lineage that first appeared on Vulture Peak in India, was then transmitted to Mount Tiantai in China, and then of course travelled to Mount Hiei in Japan. Another name that you might encounter when researching the Tendai tradition, especially if you're looking at primary materials, is the name Taishu. This is simply a shortening of the name Tendaishu by taking the second character of Tendai, that is Dai or Tai, and appending to it the word Shu, meaning school or sect. In summary then, the primary names that you'll encounter or come in contact with when you look at our tradition are as follows. Tendaishu, meaning Tendai school or Tendai sect in Japanese, Tendai Hokkeshu, meaning the Tendai Dharma Flower School, Taishu, being a shortening of Tendaishu, Tian Tai Zong, meaning Tiantai School or Tiantai Sect in Chinese, and Chon Te Zong, meaning Chon Te School or Chon Te Sect in Korean. The earliest work to refer explicitly to a lineage tradition known as the Tiantai Zong or Tiantai School is Master Zhang Andasha Guanding's The Great Meaning of the Eight Teachings of Tiantai. Apart from the title of this work itself, this text ends with the following passage. Note of clarification. This has merely been a summary description of the concepts of this Tiantai School. And so to fully examine it from first to last, one must extensively investigate other texts. Now Zhang An Dasha Guanding was a direct disciple of Master Tiantai Dasha Zhiyi, who is credited with founding the lineage in a formal sense, though this is understood to extend back to India in the spiritual. If we accept the traditional attribution of this text to Guanding then, the lineage was referring to itself by the name Tiantai by as early as before his death in 632 AD. Some modern scholars have disputed this traditional attribution and said that the work may in fact be by a later Tiantai monastic known as Ming Kuang. Ming Kuang's dates are broadly speaking unknown, but it seems fairly certain that he was a disciple of the famous Miao Le Dasha Zhanran, so we can tentatively place his lifespan within that of his teachers. In any case, the Tiantai Tendai tradition does accept the traditional attribution of this text to Master Guanding. Even if the work is not Guanding's, we can say for sure that the name Tiantai School was in use by the time of Miao Le Dasha Zhanran, because in his work, The Great Meaning of the Dharma Flower Sutra, he begins by saying the following. When explaining the 28 chapters of this sublime text, i.e. the Lotus Sutra, there are many interpreters but here I will base my exegesis on the Tiantai school. So at the earliest, this name was known and used by 632, and by the latest, it was in use by 782 AD. In either case, the name was well and truly in use before the Japanese monk Dengyo Dai Saicho traveled to China in 804 AD in order to be inducted into the school.
Now that you know when the name came into use, you might be wondering what it actually means. The short answer is easy, and you can find it in places like Wikipedia. That is, that Tiantai is the name of a mountain in China, and it's upon that mountain that this particular Buddhist denomination arose, and where its founder lived and taught. But this doesn't tell me what it means. You'll also find various explanations online that end at discussing the literal meaning of the two characters which make up the word Tiantai or Tendai. If we rely on this kind of explanation, we come up with something like the following. Tian or Ten means something like heaven or heavenly, and Tai or Dai means terrace, platform, plateau, tier. And so Tian Tai or Tendai means something like heavenly plateau or heavenly platform. Now, while this is in some sense an accurate rendering of the two Chinese characters, it in no way gives me anything that is a meaningful reference with which to understand the name's significance. Indeed, the name and its meaning have come to play a crucial role in the Tiantai Tendai worldview, and so it's worth spending a moment getting a sense of what the word Tiantai or Tendai actually means. As is so often the case with our tradition, it's a good idea to look to Master Janran to get some clarification. In his commentary to Master Zhi's Moho Zhiguan, he says the following about the name Tiantai. Tian here refers to a peak. When the primordial forces were not yet separated, they were undifferentiated and one. And then when the two forces, yin and yang, had divided, the pure became the heavens and peaks, and the impure became the earth and flat ground. This name is fundamentally a secular name, and so we rely on the secular explanations of it. Tai refers to the name of a constellation of stars. The bounds of this place correspond with the Sun Tai, or Three Tiers constellation in the heavens, and so it is from this that it gets its name. There are others who say it was originally called Tian Ti, or Heavenly Staircase. That is to say, the height of this mountain is such that should you scale it, you ascend to the heavens. Later generations perpetuated this, and so this mountain is called Tian Tai. Furthermore, Zhang Andasha Guanding's record of the mountain says, it was originally referred to as Southern Peak, but King Ling of Zhou and Crown Prince Jin resided there, and so his spirit is its protective deity. Therefore, he ordered the ministers of the left and right to change its name to Mount Tiantai. Now there's evidently quite a lot to unpack here, but let's keep it simple. Master Janran is giving us three possible derivations of the name. The first is that the first character Tian or Ten means heaven or sky, and therefore in this context it refers to that which rises to the heavens, i.e. the peaks and mountains. The second character on this reading, Tai or Dai, refers to the Sun Tai or Three Tiers constellation in the skies above that very mountain. The second option that he gives us is that the mountain was originally called Tian Ti or Heavenly Staircase. That is to say, that the height of this mountain is such that should you scale it, you ascend to the heavens. And the third option he gives us is that it was originally referred to as Southern Peak, but that King Ling of Zhou ordered his ministers of the right and left to change the mountain's name to something lofty like Mount Tiantai. Let's work our way backwards in breaking this down a little bit further. The third option is apparently recorded in Zhang Andasha Guanding's record of Mount Tiantai. This text is unfortunately lost, so we cannot go to it for more clarification. But I suspect that this is an etymology that's extrapolated from the first reason that Janran gives us. You'll see why in a moment. The second option he gives us is also quite interesting. It implies that the name Tian Ti, or Stairway to Heaven, is connected to the current name Tian Tai. But once again, I suspect that this is an element that has been extrapolated from that first reason that he gives us. Once again, you'll see why in just a moment. And so we now come to the first reason that Janran offered, and this was namely that the mountain itself is beneath a constellation called the Sun Tai, or Three Tiers constellation. And this is in fact the definition of the name Tiantai that is upheld within 
both the Tiantai and Tendai tradition. Now this Three Tears constellation is understood to be just below Ursa Major, or the Seven Stars of the Northern Dipper. So here you can hopefully see the Seven Stars of the Northern Dipper, and then below this you can see a second constellation which looks a little bit like Steps or Tears. And it's this constellation that we're interested in. Each of these platforms or tiers, from which we get the name Three Tiers Constellation, is in fact two stars. So that means that the whole constellation is made up of six individual stars. When we draw lines between them, it looks like three tiers or levels. We have a highest tier, a middle tier, and a lowest tier. It's at this point that I want to draw your attention back to the second reason that Jan Ran gave us for the name Tiantai. And that was that the mountain was so high that climbing it was like a heavenly staircase. Now, I'm not a genius, but it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to see that this particular constellation looks exactly like a staircase in the heavens. And so while it's only my summation, I suspect that this second etymology was also developed out of the constellation derivation. After all, many mountains are high enough to look like stairs in the heavens, but this doesn't tell me anything particular about this mountain, unless I see it as derivative of the constellation above it. I went one further though, and suggested to you that the story ascribed to Guan Ding about King Ling of Zhou and his Minister of the Right and Minister of the Left changing the name of the mountain was also derived from the constellation connection. So you might be wondering why I came to that conclusion. As it happens, in religious Taoism and greater Chinese folk belief, the three tiers of this three-tier constellation are each ruled by their own lord or deity. So the star lords of the three tiers are as follows. The highest tier is ruled by star lord Xu Jing Kai De. The middle tier is ruled by star lord Liu Chun Si Kong. And the lowest tier is ruled by Star Lord Chu Sheng Si Liu. And you can see these three lords on your screen presently. When you look at this image, I ask you to consider whether or not these three lords sound all that different from Guan Ding's semi mythical account of King Ling of Zhou, his Minister of the Right, and his Minister of the Left changing the name of the mountain to something lofty like Mount Tiantai. In any case, I'll leave you to be the judge of that connection. But it is this definition of the three-tier constellation which is most often hearkened to within the Tiantai Tendai tradition to make sense of the name Tiantai or Tendai. It's at this point that you're probably thinking, this is all very good and well, Jikai, but why do I care if this mountain was named after a random Chinese constellation. Isn't it enough for me to know that Mount Tiantai is a mountain connected with this particular sect of Buddhism? Well, it's the knowledge of this three tiers definition that will help you to understand the symbolism contained implicitly within the Tendai school's crest or emblem. You can usually see the crest of the Japanese Tendai school in the right hand corner of your screen. You'll also naturally see it on the maniple or wagesa that I wear. Presently, I hope you can see a larger version on the left of the screen. And when you look closely, you might notice that the background looks a little bit like a flower. This is because it's supposed to be a symbolic representation of the chrysanthemum flower, which should be on the right of your screen. Now the chrysanthemum flower is the official crest of the Japanese imperial family, and legend has it that this is because our Japanese founder Dengyo Daishi Saicho presented Emperor Kamu with a beautiful chrysanthemum flower. This image of Emperor Kamu that you can see now pictured on your screen is the one in our temple of Enmitsuji here in Sydney. Now, whether this story is true or not, the Tendai school was indeed ordered by the imperial household to pray for the nation. This protection of the nation duty is known as Chingo Koka in Japanese, and this remained the primary 
official duty of the Tendai school until the Meiji Restoration in the early modern period. This element of our crest, therefore, represents the quintessentially Japanese component of the Tendai lineage and reminds us of everything that has developed since Dengyo Daishi Saicho returned to Japan from China in 805 AD after having received permission from Emperor Kammu to travel there. The three stars in the middle of our crest then, as you might have guessed, are stars precisely because of that three tiers constellation implied by the name Tiantai or Tendai. This object therefore symbolically represents the quintessentially Chinese component of our Tiantai Tendai lineage and that enormous debt that we owe our Chinese forefathers. These three stars are also traditionally seen as a symbolic representation of our core doctrine known as the three truths. And of course, there is one star correlating to each of those truths. Now we will talk in great detail about the three truths doctrine later in the overview series. But at this stage, it suffices to know that this doctrine of the three truths is the absolute core or heart of all Tiantai Tendai doctrine. Indeed, the name of our crest is the stars of the three truths crest. In Japanese, this name would be read as Santaise. And if we were to read out in Japanese the name of the constellation to which Mount Tiantai owes its name, this would also be read as Santaise. They are both deliberate homophones, that is, words pronounced alike but with different meanings. You may be wondering then why these three stars are not shaped in tiers like the constellation in question rather than in the shape of a triangle. To appreciate this arrangement, let's take a quick look at an incredibly important sermon of the Buddha called the Mahaparinirvana Sutra and see if it has anything to offer us about the arrangement of these stars. The chunk in question that we'll be reading reads as follows. I will now cause all sentient beings and the assembly of the four groups, which are my various children, to all peacefully abide in the secret treasury. I too will peacefully abide therein by entering into Nirvana. What is it that is referred to as the secret treasury? It is just as in the case of the letter E, in which the three dots, if placed horizontally, do not constitute the letter E, and if placed vertically, also do not constitute it. If, however, they are placed like the three eyes on the face of the god Maheshvara, then they finally make the letter E. If the three dots are separated, they likewise do not constitute it. I am also like this, for the Dharma of liberation is not Nirvana. The body of the thus come one is not Nirvana, and Mahaprajna is also not Nirvana. These three Dharmas, each separately, are not Nirvana. I now peacefully abide in these three dharmas, but for the sake of sentient beings, say only that I enter nirvana, when it is in fact like the worldly letter E. So the Nirvana Sutra here uses the Sanskrit letter E written in the Siddham script as a symbol for the three qualities of a Buddha's Nirvana. Now those three qualities for argument's sake here are namely liberation or vimoksha, the body of the thus come one, or the Dharmakaya, and great wisdom, or Mahaprajna. Crucially, this excerpt is making clear that the three qualities must all be present, and that none can be prioritized over the other in order to constitute a Buddha's Nirvana. To get this point across, the Buddha says that these three qualities are like the arrangement of the god Maheshvara's three eyes. According to the text, in the same way that the god Maheshvara has three eyes arranged neither horizontally nor vertically, but rather in the shape of a triangle, so too do all of these three qualities have to be present and equal to be constitutive of a Buddha's Nirvana. He uses a second analogy to make sure that we get this point, and that is of the three dots which make up the Sanskrit letter E in the Siddham script, which you can see again is arranged in a triangle. Just like the eyes of Maheshvara, just like the three qualities of Nirvana, just like the three dots of the Sanskrit letter E in the Siddham, all of them are necessary 
They cannot be put into an unequal hierarchy, nor can they be separated. In the same way, the Tiantai Tendai tradition has always maintained that the three truths that we talked about are inseparable components of bodhi, or awakening. And it's for this reason that the three stars on our crest are arranged in this triangular shape, like the eyes of Maheshwara and like the Sanskrit letter E. The chrysanthemum flower is a quintessentially Japanese symbol. The three stars are representative of the three truths and the three tiers constellation, and is therefore associated with the Chinese elements of our tradition. And the eyes of Maheshwara and the Siddham letter E are motifs that are completely meaningless if you're not familiar with Indian thought. And so this very arrangement in the triangle on our crest represents those Indian roots and components of our tradition. Forever and always then, our tradition pays its respects to the lineage of masters starting in India, transmitted to China, and then conveyed to Japan. So to all the Tendai Buddhists out there, I ask that next time you put on your Wagesa or Hankesa, as the case may be, that you remember this eternal lineage, which stretches across these three great nations, and consider what you and your country may contribute to the lineage of Tiantai Tendai in the long run. You now know the distinct forms of our school name in different languages, the variations to the name that are sometimes used, the early users of the name, the very meaning of the name itself, as well as the symbolism encapsulated in our school crest. And so we will wrap all of this up today by discussing why this name came to refer to the school itself. In other words, what is it that we're trying to highlight when we refer to ourselves as the Tiantai or Tendai school? In 1268, the Kegonshu or Kegon school monk Gyonen wrote that our school obtained this name for the following reason. Question. Why is it called the Tiantai school? Answer. Its name comes from the mountain. This is because this school arose on that mountain. In other words, Yonen suggests very clearly that the name of the school was derived from the name of Mount Tiantai, where it first coalesced as an identifiable lineage. Now this is technically true, as the school did form on Mount Tiantai, but no other Buddhist tradition is named after the place where it was founded. And the place could have just as well been the capital of Chang'an, Jinling, or the prominent mountain of Zhuyi's master Huise, that is Mount Dasul. Around the same time as Gyonen wrote that description, the Chinese Tiantai monk Mengzhun said the following, almost as if responding to Gyonen's remarks. This mountain is the place where the great master Zhuyi's body rests and where he entered into extinction. According to Western, i.e. Indian custom, one invokes a person's name to honour them. But in this land, i.e. China, one avoids a person's name in order to pay respect to them. And so it is with this place that we therefore make known this man, i.e. Zhuyi. What's more, if one were to refer to the denomination by the name of a person, then Tiantai Zhuyi would be its source. In other words, our school is named not after a mountain per se, but in honour of the man who founded the school there. That is Tiantai Dashi Zhuyi, or the man we call Great Master Tiantai Zhuyi. Incidentally, ours is the only school in Chinese history to have been named after the person who founded it. In Japan, technically the Nichiren schools are also named after their founder, Nichiren. Although the difference with Tiantai Tendai is that they use the name of the person directly, which is something that Mengzhun told us should be avoided. It's therefore an interesting quirk of history to consider that if the Nichiren schools had followed the Tiantai Tendai habit of honouring the founder by referring to the place where he trained and lived, we would today not be talking about Nichiren Shu and Nichiren Shoshu, but perhaps about Minobu Shu or Fujishu or perhaps Taiseki Shu, respectively. In any case, 
When you hear a Tiantai Tendai Buddhist refer to their school as Tiantai, Tendai, or Chonte as the context may require, you now know that it is in honor of the school's founder, Tiantai Dashi Zhiyi, or Great Master Tiantai Zhiyi. Thank you for sticking with me, and if you like our content, please subscribe and share it where it will be of use. If you like what we do more broadly, please see our other material here or on our website. Otherwise, consider supporting us so that we can get more material like this out there for folks. This has been Jikai Dane of the En Mitsuji Tendai Temple, helping you become the potent advocate for Dharma that the Buddha calls us to be. Thanks very much.